Welcome everyone, go ahead and get settled and we'll begin in a few minutes. All right, here's another person. All right, I can get started with my uh, housekeeping stuff and then we could lead over to you. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live virtual program. I'm Amber from the Reference Adult Services Department here at the library. Thank you for joining us this evening. I have a few housekeeping items to share before we start the presentation. Tonight's program is scheduled to run until 7.30. During the program, all attendees will be muted, so report any technical issues you may have in the chat. There will be a Q&A session after the presentation. If you have a question, please enter it at that time in the chat, and we'll address as many audience questions as we can before the program ends. During the Q&A, messages in the chat will be visible to all meeting attendees. This program is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel soon after this live virtual program. If you do not want your video in the recording, make sure your video is turned off, that there's a red slash to the camera icon in the bottom left corner of your Zoom window. Tonight's presenter is Richard Hill. Richard was the first adoptee to identify his birth family through a genetic ge genealogy DNA test. Since 2008, he has been advising adoptees and genealogists through his website, dnatestingadvisor.com. He shared his entire pioneering story through his book, Finding Family, My Search for Roots and the Secrets in My DNA. Today, he will cover highlights of his story, today's DNA testing environment, and some examples of surprise discoveries. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Richard. Well, thank you, Amber. You're welcome. Yes. Well, I'm going to begin with a brief personal story. When I was 18 years old, there was a strange pain in my chest that was keeping me awake at night. So I contacted the doctor. Now our longtime family doctor had retired. So I contacted the guy who took over his practice. Well, he quickly diagnosed my problem as acid reflux, heartburn. He was thinking that stress might be the cause. So he started asking me questions. Did I, did I feel pressure to do well in school? Was I anxious about going away to college? My truthful answer to those questions was no. So he's, he's looking at my medical file and he comes up with one more question. How do you feel about being adopted? Well, most adoptees can answer that question, but until that very moment, I did not know that I was adopted. Now, at this point, I'm going to turn on my slides. I'm going to share my slides with you. And we will go from there. Okay. Oops. All right. Well, this picture uh, shows me with my adoptive parents. And I fit in nicely. And it was uh, easy for them to pass me off as their natural child, which is what uh, many adoptive parents did back then. Since I learned about my adoption just a week before I was starting college, I was focused on the future. The distant past did not seem that important. Furthermore, I knew that my parents were upset about their only child moving away from home. So I chose to keep my mouth shut about the secret that I had just uncovered. Okay, here's what we're gonna to cover today. I will talk briefly about the hurdles that adoptees face in building a family tree and why many of us don't even try. I will share some highlights of my personal search in the DNA test I used. We'll talk about DNA database growth and how that is affecting adoptee success rates. 
I'll share some examples of surprise discoveries. And we'll close with some strategies, tools, and resources that anyone can use. You know that everyone has a biological family tree. And if you're a genealogist, you also know the frustration of what we call brick walls, where ancestors on the far side are unknown. Oops. I'm sorry, Got messed up here. Okay, adoptees, the brick walls are just a lot lower. All of our ancestors, including our parents, are unknown. Well, breaking through these brick walls is not easy. In most states, adult adoptees are denied a basic human right that everyone else takes for granted. We are not allowed to see our original birth certificates. So why did they seal our birth records? Well, the reasoning made sense at the time. For centuries, children of unmarried mothers had been harshly labeled. And legislators wanted to protect the child from the stigma of illegitimacy. In today's society, that reasoning is completely outdated. This year, 40% of the newborns in the US will be born to unwed mothers, 40%. And nobody blames the children. Adult adoptees tend to fall into two categories. One group is tormented by all the unanswered questions. Who was my mother? Why did she give me up? Who was my father? Do I have siblings? What is my ethnicity? And what medical issues did I inherit? You may recognize Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine. I think his slogan, what, me worry, typifies adoptees in the second group. At least outwardly, they're not especially curious about their biological ancestors. As I recovered from my shock in the doctor's office, I myself settled into the Alfred E. Newman camp and only rarely thought about being adopted. Fourteen years later, my dad suffered a stroke that left him mostly paralyzed. He spent the last year of his life confined to bed in a long-term care facility. One day, when the two of us were alone, he brought up the subject of my adoption. I learned that my adoption was not anonymous. My birth mother was related to a family friend. Once her pregnancy began to show, she left the town where she lived and moved in with my adoptive parents. When the time for my birth arrived, they took her to the hospital where I was born. Then they brought me home with them and my birth mother returned to her hometown. I had always assumed that my birth mother was an unwed teenager, just like the girls who left my hometown. Well, not so. My birth mother had married early and then divorced her husband. After telling me this, dad delivered the biggest shock of all. My birth mother had a son with her husband and I had an older brother. Dad urged me to find my brother. Since I had been raised as an only child, I was fascinated by the possibility of having and meeting a brother. This was the revelation that finally motivated me to begin my search for answers. We don't have time to review the early part of my search, but I did identify my birth mother. This photo shows her at age 15. She was a beautiful young lady. Unfortunately, when I learned her name, I also learned of her tragic death. She and a sister were killed just 13 months after my birth. My mother was only 21 years old. 
While I was too late to meet my mother, I did find my brother. He inherited our mother's blue eyes and I did not. But otherwise, I see a resemblance in our childhood photos. Having identified my mother and found my brother, I could have stopped my search. But I also wanted to know the identity of my birth father. For many years, I crisscrossed the state of Michigan on what I'd call a genealogical mystery tour, visiting libraries and historical museums to trace my birth mother's life. I found many people who remembered her and even tracked down some of the men she had dated. After years of digging, I finally learned the name of the man my birth mother had identified as my father. I got to meet him and we hit it off quite well. This photo shows our first meeting and you may notice an obvious difference in height. I was six foot four and my supposed father was five foot seven. Other factors also cast doubt on our relationship. So we decided to confirm it. This was my introduction to DNA testing, a paternity test way back in 1990. Back then you had to go to a lab and have blood drawn. And after weeks of waiting, we were both crushed to learn that he was not my father. I kept on searching for many years, but every lead I pursued proved to be a dead end. Finally, I happened to hear a genealogist friend describe the Y DNA test. Only men have a Y chromosome and it passes down from father to son, generation after generation. Knowing that surnames usually pass down the same way, I wondered if this test could reveal the surname associated with my paternal line. I decided it was worth a try. I ordered a Y DNA test from Family Tree DNA. They compared my Y chromosome to every other man in the database. My closest match was to a man in Florida. I emailed him, but he had no knowledge of any relatives ever living in Michigan where I was born. But if you go back in time through my father's father's father and his father's father's fathers, our lines must intersect in one man. Unless there was an adoption or other name change somewhere, my father should have had this man's surname. Fortunately, I had compiled a long list of men my mother dated, worked with, or otherwise must have known. Most of them were dead now, and no one name had stood out from the rest. Well, my Y DNA test changed that. One of the men on my suspect list had the same last name as my DNA match. He was long gone, but with the help of a local genealogy group, I tracked down a niece of his who agreed to help me uncover the truth. She gave me this photo. The man my mother surely knew was one of five brothers a fact that raised a new complication. All five would have inherited the same Y chromosome from their father. And all five had been in the same geographic area as my mother. So any one of these brothers could have known her and passed on that Y chromosome to me. So now instead of one suspect, I had five. And worse yet, all of them were long gone. My primary suspect, the man my mother surely knew, was the middle brother. He wasn't as tall as the others, but I do think he looks like the ladies man of the bunch. Fortunately, DNA still held the promise of an answer. Children of my father would be half siblings to me. Children of the other men would be first cousins 
and share substantially less DNA with me. I convinced one child of each man to do a so-called sibling test. This is basically a paternity test using just 16 markers. When applied to relationships other than parent and child, all this test can do is calculate the probability that two people are siblings. But in 2007, it was my only hope. Once all the results were in, the lab declared with 80% certainty that the guy in the center was my father. Well, that fit nicely with the known facts, so we finally had an answer. And as my birth mother's family had done many years earlier, my birth father's family welcomed me with open arms. And I began to develop a good relationship with my newfound cousins and siblings. I realized that genetic genealogy could help thousands of other adoptees. And in 2008, I created my website, DNA Testing Advisor, to share what I had learned. Over the years, I have added to the site and it now works on mobile devices too. My story was such a breakthrough that I was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. My website traffic jumped and many more adoptees began to test. Later, a new type of test became available. Autosomal DNA testing checks DNA you inherit from both parents. Both men and women can test. And the people you match can be related to you through any branch of your family tree, out to five generations or so, and sometimes more. These are the current autosomal DNA tests and the year they were introduced to the gene genealogy community. 23andMe, Family Finder, Ancestry DNA, my heritage DNA and living DNA. By then I was into genealogy and testing known relatives can help you sort your matches into different branches of your family tree. So I decided to test two of my new paternal side relatives, one each on the first two tests that were then available. These new tests are also great for relationship testing. Unlike the old technology sibling test, they check more than a half million DNA locations and measure how much DNA two people have in common. When I was trying to identify my father, I was trying to distinguish a half sibling from first cousins. On these new tests, the difference is obvious. With half siblings sharing, around 25%, and first cousins only sharing half as much, around 12.5%. The first of my new relatives to submit a DNA sample was one of the guys I had identified as a first cousin. As such, we should have about 12.5% of our DNA in common. He did the 23andMe test. I was shocked by the result. The amount of DNA we shared was more than 22%. Clearly, he and I were not related as cousins. We had to be half siblings. Obviously, I was eager to see the results of my presumed sister who did the family finder test. Years earlier, that sibling test had convinced us all that her father was my father. For that to be true, she and I would have to share about 25% of our DNA on this test. Family Finder clearly identified her as a first cousin. While this test reports shared DNA in a unit called centimorgans, it works out to 13%. I was now certain which of the five brothers had been my father. 
But when I told the man's daughter the news, she had trouble believing it. So she asked me to test her DNA. For years, she and I had believed that we were cousins. But Family Finder confirmed her as my half sibling. She accepted the new findings and my search was really over. By the way, many paternity testing companies are still selling the outdated sibling tests. I do my best to tell people that better tests are available. But almost every week I hear from someone who did a sibling test and is confused by inconclusive results. My personal situation was more than a bit awkward. For five years, we had all believed that the guy in the middle had been my father. Now I knew for sure it was not him. I had to contact all my family and friends to update them on the new findings. Fortunately, everyone took the news well. So which of the five brothers was my father? It was this guy. I have given many presentations in person where I ask people to vote for their choice by a show of hands, just based on appearance alone. Very few pick the first guy and most actually pick the fourth guy. This just reminds us that appearance alone can be a poor indicator of exact relationships. So if in doubt, do the test. This is my father as a young man. Then there's me at roughly the same age. Comparisons like this are fun for anyone. So you can imagine how exciting it is for an adoptee to see photos of biological ancestors. When I began my search, this man was still alive, but my birth mother never told him about me. And with all the secrecy surrounding my birth, I was unable to identify him until it was much too late for us to meet. During my exhaustive search, I had interviewed many people who knew him and my birth mother quite well. Yet not one person ever put the two of them together as a possible couple. Yet decades after their deaths, the secret relationship that they took to their graves was revealed through the DNA of their descendants. That's the power of genetic genealogy. Well, now I can show you pictures of my real parents. I'm not trying to confuse you, but I do want to make a point. To me, Harold and Thelma Hill will always be my real parents. They were the ones who were there for me day and night, year after year. And their influence shaped me into the person I am today. Both are long gone now, but when I use the terms mom and dad, I am referring to them. On the other hand, my first parents did pass on the DNA of my ancestors, which predetermined various things about me. That certainly makes them real parents too. In truth, we are all products of nature and nurture. For adoptees, this basic fact is just much more obvious because those two factors come from four different people. If you would like to read the full story of my decades long search, my book is called Finding Family my search for roots and the secrets in my DNA. It's a good story full of useful tips and it's available in print, ebook and audiobook formats on Amazon and other booksellers. I am pleased to report that Finding Family has been extremely well received by both everyday readers and professional book reviewers. I'm sharing one professional book review here plus a recent summary of more than 500 reviews on Amazon.
When I did my Y-DNA test in 2006, today's autosomal tests did not exist. When I identified my father in 2011, the first autosomal databases were still tiny. At the end of 2012, a genealogist began tracking database growth. The volume grew modestly for the next few years. You may remember an ad where this guy traded his lederhosen for a kilt after a DNA test showed he was Scottish instead of German. Ancestry DNA and 23andMe both began to invest heavily in ads with the ethnic ancestry theme. Their strategy worked. After the ethnicity ad started, growth in the autosomal DNA databases skyrocketed. The total number of people tested is now estimated to be over 30 million, with about 20 million of them taking the ancestry DNA test. As a result of this massive growth, all of us are now getting more and closer matches. For the past few years, Blaine Bettinger has been surveying adoptee success. Here's what he found for adoptees who tested in the last couple years. When adoptees logged into their DNA accounts, 71% of them saw a half first cousin or closer. 92% saw a half second cousin or closer. As a result of DNA testing, 64% identified a parent, 31% found a sibling. If you have watched television shows like Long Lost Family, you know that all kinds of people are using DNA to find lost or previously unknown family members. Most of this activity results from a deliberate search by genealogists, adoptees, donor-conceived people, and other people with unknown biological fathers. But with DNA testing, we must remember that surprises are possible. With databases this big, many unexpected matches are also showing up. Most result from what we call an NPE. Originally, that stood for non-paternal event, but people understand it more quickly when we say not the parent expected. You can see some common surprises here. To show you some real life NPE revelations, I don't have to look beyond my own DNA accounts. This close family match showed up on my ancestry DNA account. I had never heard of this woman, yet she and I shared 1,412 centimorgans of DNA. When a mystery match shows up, you can go to dnapainter.com and check this tool based on data from Blaine Bettinger's shared centimorgans project. I enter 1,412 centimorgans, and it tells me there is a 92% probability that we are related by one of the re relationships shown in the gray box. Since we are in a similar age range and both of us have well-researched family trees, the only relationship that made sense was half-sibling. Since she also matches my paternal side relatives at Ancestry, it is obvious that we share the same father. This woman and I corresponded and talked on the phone. This was obviously a shock to her, but she learned to accept the news. Her parents were both gone by the time of this discovery, and it helped that we were able to finally meet face to face, though she lives on the other side of the country. We stay in touch and are both happy that we discovered each other. I also got a close match to a woman on Family Finder. 
In this case, she and I share 919 centimorgans. Back to the shared centimorgan project tool. I enter 919. She sure looks like a first cousin. And the relatives we have in common are on my paternal side. Thanks to some known facts surrounding her birth, we knew right away which one of my father's brothers had been her father. Not to be left out, 23andMe provided me with yet another surprise match. Remember, they report shared DNA as a percentage. In this case, 14%. Fortunately, the shared centimorgan tool lets you enter percentages. It will calculate the number of centimorgans and show the relationship probabilities. This woman is another first cousin, also on my father's side. In this case, there was no other information. And with all five men being deceased, I could not ask them. I figured out where this cousin fit by using another DNA painter tool called What Are the Odds? What Are the Odds is designed to help you figure out where someone called the target might fit into a known family tree by using the amount of DNA they share with people in that tree. I built a simple tree starting with the five brothers from the photo you saw earlier. One of them was my father and the other four were uncles. I'm using first name initials here, but if you read my book, you will know who they are. I plugged her in hypothetically as a child of each brother. Plus a sixth possibility that she was a child of my grandfather. Then I added other family members to the tree who had done the same test and recorded how much DNA each person shared with her. For example, a grandchild of Uncle D has tested and shares 955 centimorgans with the target. My son shares 433 with her and so on. The tool calculates a probability score for each hypothesis. The red score equals zero indicates an impossible placement given the known amounts of shared DNA. She can't be another half sibling to me and she can't be a child of Uncle Jay. The green scores indicate family tree positions that are possible and each one has a probability score. One relationship stands out as the most likely by far. Hypothesis one has a score of 7,644, which is 546 times more likely than the next best score of 14. This mysterious match is clearly a child of my uncle D. Of the five brothers on my paternal side, three of them fathered children by women other than their wives. The man on the left fathered me, my ancestry DNA half sibling, and another man mentioned in my book. The guy in the middle fathered my 23andMe cousin. And the guy next to him fathered my family finder cousin. So were all the secret children on my paternal side? Well, not quite. I also found a surprise match on my maternal side. As I shared in my book, I had a long relationship with my birth mother's older sister. She had two daughters from her first husband and four more daughters from her second husband. The first cousin match revealed a secret my aunt had taken to her grave. In between her two marriages, she got pregnant by a third man and gave up a son for adoption. All the surviving daughters were shocked, but thrilled when they got to meet their new brother. So here's my basic DNA testing strategy. Whether you're a genealogist or an adoptee, you need to get into all five of the autosomal DNA databases that provide matches. Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, Family Finder, 
my heritage, and most recently, living DNA. You can save money by testing with the first two and getting into the others through free uploads. If you're a male, also consider the Y DNA test for tracing your direct paternal line. Unless you're lucky enough to match a parent or sibling, there's still a lot of work ahead to get you from distant genetic cousins to immediate members of your birth family. There are two basic approaches. You can do it all yourself or you can outsource the search. You need to trace the family trees of your genetic cousins to find your common ancestors and then come forward in time along the many branches to find descendants in the time and place of your birth. To do this yourself, you need to learn the tools of genealogy and genetic genealogy. You can do that most efficiently by watching webinars and reading books. Here are some great resources for doing that. Legacy Family Tree Webinars is a service you can subscribe to that has many, many great webinars for learning about genealogy and DNA testing. The Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy is a book by Blaine Bettinger that is probably the Bible of, of DNA testing today. And now there's also an adoptee's guide to DNA testing that's even more adoptee specific. You will probably need to invest in one or more genealogical database subscriptions. Here are some important ones that can help you trace dead people. Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, and Newspapers.com, which will have a lot of obituaries, for example, which are a huge help. Well, once you work your way forward in time, you may also need a paid people search tool to trace living people that you won't find in these databases. Each DNA test includes a different mix of tools for working with genetic matches. To efficiently extract the most information from your matches, you also need to learn and use a variety of third-party DNA tools. Here are some examples. GEDmatch.com, DNA Painter, Genetic Affairs, DNAadoption.com, and DNAGEDcom.com. There are others too. Many are free, but some have fees. Facebook is clearly the epicenter for ongoing news and discussions about DNA testing. And here's a small sample of places you should follow. DNA Newbie, where you can get a lot of your new questions answered. Genetic Genealogy Tips and Techniques is a little more advanced. The International Society of Genetic Genealogy. DNA Testing Advisor is my own Facebook page. DNA Tools, DNA for Genealogy. And there are many, many search groups specific to adoptees. Plus many of the DNA tests and third-party tools also have user groups on Facebook, which can answer your questions about using their specific tools. I maintain and periodically update a PDF file of useful genetic genealogy links that you can download for free from my website. The nearly 300 links include DNA tests, third-party tools, Facebook groups, helpful articles, bloggers, books, conferences, interviews, and so on. There are even separate sections for adoptees and adoptee resources. If you use a computer, the download link will be right on the home page as shown here. If you're using a tablet or smartphone, it takes just one column at a time and you will need to scroll down a ways to find it. Today, more people are choosing to outsource birth family searches to experts. Compared to doing it all yourself, there's a greater chance of success. And that success will often happen much, much faster. Speed is especially important in a birth family search. 
because you want to find birth parents while they are still alive. That's something I was unable to do, but if you don't take too long to do this, you may be more successful than me. Ideally, you would want to find a search angel. These wonderful people do birth family searches for free. And your best chance of finding a search angel to work your case is in a Facebook group, DNA Detectives. Unfortunately, that group has grown to 160,000 members and the demand for such help greatly exceeds the supply. The best search angels are severely overworked and others to, who offer to help often lack the skills and experience to solve the more challenging cases. It's an unfortunate truth that not every case is solvable by anyone, no matter who's working on it. And I've heard heartbreaking stories of adoptees paying detective agencies and others $5,000 to $10,000 and getting nothing in return. Well, I recently learned about Origins International, which is the one that offers a guaranteed birth parent search. After a free case review, they offer a fixed price for your search. And if they can't find your birth parent within 90 days, they give you 100% of your money back. I interviewed the principals and the head researcher and was quite impressed. There are other companies with similar names. So write down the URL to share with adoptees you know. O -R -I G I N S I N T L dot com forward slash D N A. I currently have four presentations on DNA testing topics. This is finding family with DNA testing. The others are understanding the ethnic ancestry in your DNA test, why chromosome insights and strategies and a genetic genealogy overview. Each presentation is entirely different. So if you enjoy this presentation, I'd be happy to return to this group someday for another session. This concludes my slides. You can always reach me with questions by email at this address, richard at dna-testing-advisor.com. You must include the hyphens in the email address. You can reach my website with or without the hyphens. Well, now it's time for me to close this, the slides and answer tonight's questions. Share. Okay. All right, looks like there's a few questions already. So let me scroll All back right. up. Um, Rochelle asks, how much total DNA is there in centimorgans? Well, typically uh, full siblings and parent and child will share around um, 3,400, 3, roughly that. And so they're sharing around 50%. 50 so if you double that, that would be about uh, 6,800 total. There are tables and such that can give you this kind of information. Um, the ISOG, International Society of Genetic Genealogy has a wonderful wiki on their website that uh, has information like this and lots of reference tables and so on. Kim asks, which testing do you feel is best and why? Well, I feel that the autosomal testing is best because it's most successful to find, uh, you know, find your family if you're looking for like a birth parent search or, or any kind of genealogical mystery, uh, because you're going to have the most uh, the most matches, uh, and it can reach any any branch of your family tree. So I think that's if you're asking about a specific test, every one of them has their own unique strengths. 
Um, Ancestry DNA has the biggest database by far. So I think most people would say, start with that. Uh, but unless you get real lucky and find an answer through that, you're probably going to need to get into more of the databases. Uh, is the common uh, recommendation is to fish in all the ponds. And that's because your relatives um, may have chosen a different test than you did, and you have no way of knowing that up front. So if you test and take one of the tests and some good close relative who could solve your mystery takes a different test, you're, you're not going to see each other there because you're in totally different databases. So um, that's why the, the general recommendation is to, particularly for an adoption search, is to uh, get in all of them. All right, now the question is, which Y test would you suggest? 12, 25, 36, 62, 111, or the big Y? Okay, uh, family tree DNA is the obvious source for this type of Y DNA testing. Uh, they no longer offer uh, 12 or 25. The minimum is now 37. They have also dropped the 67. So now your choices are 37, 111 or big Y. For most people, 37 is enough uh, for what you need. Now, when would you upgrade to 111? And that would be if you got so many matches at 37 markers and you needed to resolve them, just tell them which ones were really closer. And most of those people had done 111 then by upgrading to 111, you, you kind of sort them out. You'll see a little better breakout of which ones are the really close ones. In general, you don't get more matches by, uh, by testing more markers. You might, but since they weren't close enough at 37 to be considered a match, even if you match fine on the, the next ones up to 111, uh, they're still not gonna be one of your closest matches. So. And as far as big Y goes, big Y is a test for experts. I've done it. Uh, a lot of people I know have done it. Uh, I find it fascinating. It really helps the science of, of all of this. As far as being a genealogical breakthrough, most of us, and I'm not saying not everybody, but most of us will not, um, will not greatly benefit from, from taking that test. Okay. While people are putting in questions, I'm gonna share an evaluation link so that they can open that in another tab. Okay. Um, looks like Rochelle has another question. If a known first cousin shows that it's 389 centimorgans, is that likely um, not a, a first cousin? That's pretty low for a first cousin. Uh, again, I would say go to DNA Painter and look at that shared centimorgan table and just plug that number in and see what it gives you as the probabilities of the different relationships. Sometimes there are, there are half relationships, uh, you know, for example, like if you're, uh, um, you know, normally in a first cousin, it's because your, um, your parents were full siblings. But what if your parents were only half siblings, you know, then you don't have as much DNA and you're gonna get a lower number. So, uh, that does a good job of, of sorting out all those different combinations that, it, that a given match could be, could represent. Okay. Barbara shared a free upcoming genealogy um, webinar, it looks like, with the link. So you could, anyone who's interested can check that out. Anybody else have any other questions? And in the follow-up email, I can share the different um, resources you mentioned, and I can share a link to your website. So um, everyone will be able to access that. Speaking of upcoming presentations in, uh, Ju let's see, in June, I can't remember the exact dates, the Southern California Genealogical Society is having two uh, basically online conferences. One of them is a genealogy conference. The other one is a genetic genealogy conference. Um, normally you got to go to California 
to to speak or you have to go to California to to, to witness these, these conferences. Well, now that it's all virtual, um, they've been able to draw in speakers from all over. I'm one of the speakers there and many other good speakers are there. Uh, also, uh, uh, you can register online and you can enjoy it and you can, uh, there's certain events that will be live and then other ones, you just have a list of recordings that you can watch at your leisure. And I think it's like six months out or something like that you have, but that's a really good national type of conference that uh, I think is, is worth anybody's time if you really want to study this. Well, yeah, I'll try to share that one too. Any other questions before we uh, start wrapping up? All right. There's no other questions, uh, we can start wrapping up. So thank you so much for sharing about DNA testing and your experience with us. Um, you can check out his book from our library's collection if you have an interest in reading it. Um, and thank you all for attending tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed it. Please take a few minutes to tell us what you thought about the program in um, the short event evaluation that's linked further up in the chat. And that will be emailed out as well. Visit our website, www.howellibrary.org to discover more upcoming events from the Howell Carnegie District Library. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.